Welcome to Lesson 5 in the C Sharp from Start to Finish course. My name is Tim Corey and today we're looking at logic planning. Now so far in this course we have scoped out our requirements, we have built the overall structure for our application as far as our design, we have designed our data backend and drawn out our front end. In this step what we're going to do is look at some of the, the global ideas for how we're going to wire up our different forms. Now there's a lot more to logic than just wiring up forms, but you'll find that wiring up the forms will do most of the major heavy lifting for your application. By the time you're done, you'll have just a few things left to do before your application is running. So today we're going to talk through those global ideas, the big picture ideas. We won't get into the nitty gritty of actually writing code, but instead we'll talk through what each different piece of the application should do. If I were to do this on paper, which I recommend you do, I'd write out some notes and thoughts on what each piece is going to do. I would redraw out each form and kind of put arrows there and, and say, okay, this button is going to do this and that button's going to do that. Now, again, we're on screen. We're not showing a piece of paper. So what I will do instead is I'll bring up the form and then we'll talk through the logic behind each different piece. Like before, the order doesn't matter, but I'm actually going to readjust our order a little bit because I want to talk about one of the forms last because it's the most complicated, most, most complex. So let's go through the easier, more simple ones first, and then we'll get to the more complex one at the end. So let's start with the create tournament form. Before we get started in the lesson, I want to remind you that if you'd like to get all of these lessons right away, plus all these other bonuses, click the link below in the description to purchase this course for just $67. And while you're considering that, don't forget to hit the thumbs up on this video. I'd really appreciate it. Okay, so let's get back to the lesson. And this is the form we created in our previous step. We kind of drew it out. Again, remember that this is just a design of the application. It's not the actual form itself. It's just a concept of what the form will probably look like or at least the, the structure of it. So the first thing we want to look at is this create new button. It's actually a button or a button link. But what this does is it's going to create a new team. Now remember we have a new team form. So this button will open up that new form. But it's not done there. Once the new team gets created, we want to close out the new team form and come back to this form and have that data on the screen now in the team slash players list box. And how we're going to do that is we'll probably create a method that the create team form can call saying, okay, here is the new team. Here's a new team object. And that's where if you remember back to our big idea, the overview planning we did, we talked about key concepts. And one of the key concepts was interfaces. And this is probably a good place to have an interface because that way the form doesn't have to know the create team form does not need to know about the tournament creator form. It just needs to know about the contract that the tournament creator form implements. And if you're not sure what that means, don't worry about it. We'll actually show it in code and we'll talk through it and talk through the different options we have. That's just where varying levels of experience will show you more or less that you need to do at a certain junction or give you more of an idea of how you're going to do it. But if you don't have that experience, don't worry. You'll learn how to do it. And then next time you'll have that experience. Next, let's look at the Add Team button. Now this button's pretty straightforward what it needs to do. It's going to look at which item is selected in that dropdown right above it. And it's going to take that item and put it in the list for the tournament players list box. It's also going to remove it from the drop down list that it pulled it from. Once it's done both of those steps, we're going to need to refresh both the drop down list and also the list box. Next, we have the create prize button. And this button works almost exactly like the create new over the selected team drop down. The create prize button is going to open up a new form, wait until the prize gets created and then take the value from that created prize and put it in the prizes list box. So really the logic is basically the same. 
It's just which class you're creating. So there's not much more we need to say there. Next, we have these two delete selected buttons. What each of these is going to do, and they are so similar, I just highlighted them both. What each of these is going to do is when you click that button, it's going to delete whatever item in the list box to its left is selected. In the case of the team's list box, the additional step is it's going to put that team back in the select team drop down box. And finally, we have the create tournament button. And this is actually the big one because a lot of stuff goes on behind the scenes when this button is clicked. First of all, we're going to, need to validate all this information. So for example, we need to make sure we have a tournament name. We need to make sure that the entry fee isn't something like a negative number. We have to make sure that we have at least two teams because a tournament can't be a tournament with only one team. Once all of that is done, we then need to create the schedule. Remember, we talked about the fact that we have that rounds property, which is a list of a list of matchup. We have that rounds property, but we don't have that on the create tournament form because that's not something that the user does. That it gets populated on the click of this create tournament button. First, we'll need to figure out how many teams should be in the tournament. And if you read the companion document that comes along with this course, you'll see some, I've written out the formula for how to determine how many teams should be in a tournament. And then also how many buys we should have to make up for the missing teams. So for example, if we have 10 teams in the tournament, the tournament needs to start with 16 teams. So therefore we need to have six buys in the first round. And so how that gets worked out is determined in this create tournament button click. It won't happen right behind the button in the code behind, but this is where that logic gets kicked off. We will also then need to randomize the order for the first round. Once all that's complete, then we're really done with this form. So let's move on to the create team form. This form is a little simpler, but let's look at some of the interesting pieces of it. First, the add member button. This is going to take an existing team member from the drop down list and add it to the tournament player list box on the right. That logic is very similar to the previous form where we had the add team button. Don't forget that when we add the member to the list box, we have to remove that member from the drop down list and refresh both lists. The next interesting piece is the create member button. What this will do is take those four fields above, create a new team member, and add them to the tournament player's list box. It will also then clear out those four fields. Finally, the create team button will allow us to first of all validate this team and then create them. The other thing we'll do is send this information back to the caller. Now the one thing you may have noticed that's missing on this form, and it's not something that we realized at the previous stage is that we don't have a delete player button on this form somewhere. We're going to need to add that. And this part in the process, again, it's really nice to have it drawn on paper because I can just draw it in. But since I don't have it drawn on paper, I'm just going to put it in my notes to make sure to add that. The other thing we'll do is make it the same as the other delete buttons because the users want to see a similar experience across all the forms. That way they get more comfortable with how things work and know what to expect when they see certain things. Okay, moving on, we have the create prize form. And this is even simpler. This essentially is the same as the previous page with just the add new member field or section. So the create prize has four text boxes, and when we hit the create prize button, it's going to need to validate the information and then send that information back to the calling form and close this form. And that's all there is to it. The next form is the tournament dashboard. This is really simple. It has a list of existing tournaments. If you select one and hit load tournament, it's going to load the selected tournament viewer for that given tournament. So that's what the load tournament button does. The create tournament button just opens the create tournament form. 
And that's really all this form does. The only thing that will be different is we'll have to capture when a tournament gets created and put that new tournament in the dropdown for the load existing tournament dropdown. That way, once you create a tournament and the form closes, you can then load that tournament. And that brings us to our last form, the tournament viewer. And this is the fun one because it has a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that makes it a little more complex, but I think we can definitely dive into it and understand the overall view of what's happening in this form. First and very simply, the tournament name will get updated when we load this form. When the form gets loaded, we're going to pass in that tournament object so we'll know what the name is. And we'll just put that in this label. Next, we have a drop down with rounds. Now, so far, I haven't really highlighted the drop downs. Essentially, they're just loading information from a database or from a text file. But with this drop down, it's a little different because this is actually calculated. So, what's going to happen is we have that list of a list of matchup. And we call that whole object rounds. This drop down will figure out how many rounds are in a rounds object. I know it doesn't make sense necessarily when you talk about it. You gotta kind of see it on paper. But essentially what's gonna happen is if a tournament has four rounds, we're gonna have to put in this drop down list round one, round two, round three, round four. And it has to know go to the list entry for round one or round two. So that drop down will change what the matchup list box shows. But next, we have the unplayed only checkbox. If this is checked, which I plan on having it checked by default, if it's checked, then we will further filter the matchup list box, not only by which round we're in, but also by if the game has been played or not. Next, we have this section over here that displays the scores and allows us to update or change the scores. So based upon who is selected in the matchup list box, that will determine which matchup then gets displayed on the right. First, we'll update the team names, team one, team two. And then if they have scores, we'll put those scores in these score boxes. And finally, this score button right here will allow us to change that matchup's scores. And based upon this, it will finalize and say, the matchup is over and this is who won. Now that's where it gets really interesting because we're gonna have to figure out some way of triggering then other things based upon a matchup being scored. For example, if this is the last unplayed game in the round, hitting the score button here should trigger the next round. Remember that we email people when they are scheduled to play. We also email out the results of a round. And if this was the last game in the last round, meaning the championship game, we then trigger the end of tournament information, meaning we then assign prizes and we trigger the, that final email saying who won, who got what, and what the results were. Now that raises an issue, or at least a question, and that is, can we mark played games with a new score? So for example, say it was a basketball game, and the score for sample team one was 95, and the score for sample team two was 75. We put those values in and hit score, but then we realize instead of 95 and 75, it was 95 and 82. Can we go back in and update that score? And I think the answer has to be that yes, we can, as long as we're still in the current round. Remember that teams can't play each other until they're in the right round. Meaning, if we know that we're going to play each other in the next round, but the, this current round's not over, we can't play each other in that next round yet. All the games have to be done in the current round before the next round gets started. So as long as we're in the current round, we can adjust those scores. Because think of it this way. What if sample team one was given 95 points and sample team two was given 75? But in actuality, we got it backwards. Sample team one should have gotten 75 points, 
in Sample Team 2 should have gotten 95 points. And that changes the outcome of the game. If we were already in the next round, that would change who plays who in the existing round. That could cause some major issues. So I think we need to lock this so that we can only modify scores in the existing round. Which means that this score button needs to have logic in it that says, are we in the current round? And that's really it for the tournament viewer. So that raises this question. What are the other pieces we haven't really covered in our logic planning? And I'm, we've got quite a few. For example, we haven't really talked about data access. How are we going to access the data, store the data? How are we going to deal with two different data sources that are very, very different? How are we going to email out information? What triggers that? What triggers knowing who plays the next matchup? These are some areas that we're going to dive in when we actually get to the code. We can't plan everything out in abstract. Some things it's just easier to be in the code and then plan. So we've done what we can with our planning outside of Visual Studio. We've created our data design. We've created our UI layout. We have looked at what logic needs to be behind that user interface in order to use and move the data around properly. We're not going to worry about trying to plan out every bit of the other pieces of logic at this point. We'll get to that once we've done all we can to put what we have in code. So that brings us to what's coming up next. And up next, we're going to talk about taking our data design and putting that into actual code. We're going to create our class library and prepare that for use in our application. Before you go, you'll see a link on the left to buy this course. Check out the intro video on this playlist for more information about what you get if you pay. Also, if you are ever wondering what you could do to help this channel out without paying money, I've listed six things that really help. I'd appreciate if you considered doing one or more of these. Thanks again, and don't forget to keep practicing what you learned.